Hi everyone, welcome back to D4 Data Channel podcast on the topic Neural Search with Gina.ai. And with me we have Mr. Joan, and Joan is from the Gina AI team, and he is heading the engineering division in the Gina team for the neural search uh, function. And uh, Mr. Joan is from uh, Barcelona, Spain, and uh, he's been working in this AI and software engineering for quite some time. And uh, uh thank you thank you john for uh joining this podcast thank you for having for having me actually great so i have a couple of questions for you today regarding the gina ai components so first of all uh so the first first question is about the neural search capability which gina has so why would gina open source its neural search capabilities when other major players are busy packaging them as paid api services well this is actually it comes from the very basic foundation of the company. So the founders of the companies, they were actually busy in the past doing open source and they are strong and all the companies are strong believer of open source. Not because we are not business oriented or anything, but we do believe that open source gives fast feedback, fast cycles of corrections, fast interactions with the community. It's fast to give something and know how the community accepts if you are if you have paid customers from day zero it means that you may not give this get this feedback so fast and then it's a win-win situation between the community that gets this technology free and the providers of the technology that get to learn from it for instance there is there is an example that i don't know if we could have done so in our second major version of gina the main package we did a great refactoring because we understood that although the technology behind the underlying technology is very similar, the, the interfaces that we were presenting were hard to understand and the community were, were having some troubles um, using them. So we got this feedback and we, we implemented a much easier set of layers of abstraction and the community loved it. I am not sure, I really doubt that we could have done this pivoting without being open source. Just as okay. an example. Got it, got it, okay. So my next question is on the, uh, like some specific details about the neural search capability in Gina.ai. So which data type was the easiest to start while building this particular neural search function, whether it was test, image, or audio? So actually the easiest to work with at the beginning, it was mostly text and image, but for a very simple reason, it's about the, the, the size of the community. So at the beginning, especially at the beginning, in Gina, we were relying very strongly on pre-trained models. And the amount of pre-trained models that you get for processing text and image, especially text, maybe, it goes, it's much larger than the ones for audio. And then also from, the headcount perspective, most of our engineers have de dealt with text and image. It's not so easy to have people that have dealt significantly with audio. Then it's changed because, and that's why I, why we developed this fine tuner um, project inside our ecosystem. We we saw that although the pre-trained models give really good results for the starters, there is this last mile delivery part that is not so easy to achieve. And then the fine tuning came came in and so on. But yeah, it would detect an image, but because of the, the community and the amount of uh, available models out there. Okay, okay, got it. So my next question is on like, uh, so mostly uh, AI is being kind of uh, very much impacting towards different domains in the uh, space, basically, like whether it's healthcare, finance, retail, education sector, whatever. So uh, when we are using the Gina's, Gina's neural search component in the domain-centric data, how well it's actually performing? Well, this is a really good question, but I wouldn't even put the, the, the emphasis on Gina's. I would say about neural search in general. And I think it's, so as neural search is, is a based on how the quality of the embeddings of how you represent your unstructured data. And then I come more or less back to the same topic of why text and image was easier than audio is there are bunch of open data sets about text, images, potentially audio, but people are not so eager to share their data on finance, healthcare, education. So for instance, I think 
I recently I have seen that there is some models that try to move tabular data into embeddings and this kind of stuff. So the future of neural search and this kind of the domain centric data and the and the capacity of neural search to provide solutions there it depends a lot on the evolution of these models. Then if they will be publicly available or not then in, a, in the open source domain is is harder to get access to this data and to work on it and then also the learnings from it may not be so easy to transfer to other domains or to other specific tasks in the subdomain. It's something that we didn't have the chance to, to investigate so, so much in depth. Okay, okay. So, uh, uh, so what is the one distinguishing component in Gina's search function? So, there is, I wouldn't talk about a specific feature because the, what is specific about Gina search is that it's not a function, it's an ecosystem, a framework. So, in comparison with other um, players in, the, in this neural search domain or in this search domain like vector database or so on, a lot of these companies are focusing on one of the specific problems. So about sharing models or about storing vectors, large scale vectors. And what Gina is distinguished by is the fact that Gina provides a solution that tackles the neural search problem in a, from, from zero to the end. So it provides abstractions to build like the Docker array. I don't know. I hope someone, some listeners from the community or get to learn from us. They will see that we have a document array package that is intended for data science to do the data scientists for to do the first itera the, the first iterations to do the first learnings and the first observation of data. Then we have Gina main repository that goes like it. We have these executors where your tasks are micro are split into microservices. Then we have the flow infrastructure to build your pipelines of search. We have our hub to, to, to handle these models and to have them shared with the community. This is, I think, the strongest point from, for Gina. OK, OK, perfect. So uh, could you talk a bit about the embedding techniques in the neural search component? So embedding techniques, so we are as a, as a framework, so we are giving the power to the user to deal with any neural and any embedding technique. And this embedding technique, actually, it's anything that transforms an, a document of unstructured data into a into a vector, right? Then the quality of this embedding depends on how you trained it. So you can get pretty decent accuracy by extracting from classical um, computer vision problem of image net classification, you can extract one of the previous layers and you can use it, but it has not been trained for that. Normally, the best techniques is trying some metric learning capacity with triplet losses, um, um, CMEs, networks, and this kind of techniques, because the, then the, the models are trained to actually work as neural search should work, that close closer semantic documents are close to each other and the other way around. Okay, okay, got it. So over to a uh, few other sections in the Gina.ai or the other services from Gina.ai. So uh, like, so there is a very big component called Hub, which uh, Gina.ai actually developed and it's, it's really great. So how do you compare with other model repositories at this point? Well, it, you could, I am not an expert on other, other repositories, but I think you should expect the same. So the point is that this is um, for our for our own creations, these executor components that we developed. But you can upload your your executors, you can download them, you can package them into Docker images, you can use direct you can use them directly into a flow. So it's inspired by by all these hub repositories and just for our own purpose. And now we are developing into make it more interactive, make the make the user easily find the best models. It's not exactly a model; it's an executor as our construction. But one can think of them as models or pre-processing steps, which can fit better to fill the power of this in a more interactive way. Okay. Okay. Good. So uh, right now, like as you mentioned, like uh, even 
anyone can actually kind of upload or uh, download the models from that hub so what is the flexibility offered or like how is it kind of like progressed in the hub development space so what we are we are developing more is also into whole hosting some of these model, models and microservices on our end so that the user can enjoy more powerful um, models even from their lo from their local setting without needing so big machines so we are moving all our infrastructure and pushing this cloud nativeness even further okay okay so fine tuner is a very important component which i observed in the gina ai stack actually so uh, it did literally fine tunes and embedding and it, it kind of boost the existing embedding yes. across, uh, against the data basically so what is the design idea behind this process so the the idea is the idea comes from our own experience so that what we found is that all our ecosystem was working really well in terms of performance it was easy to integrate and stuff but what gina as a microservice architecture had limited limited power on the quality of your search results and we saw that it was really hard to get this 10 percent uh, this 10 percent i'm not this extra uh, extra mile of quality and we thought that even for ai engineers people experienced with ml and um, tuning these models for search is not so easy it's not and normally you may have no label data or so on so the the design idea was let's have something that using our document structure and how we reason about documents and how we group them can we have even for labeled or unlabeled data uh, something that very easily someone can come and almost automatically get an improvement of of their search results without too much hyperparameter tuning or too much thinking and that it should support some different frameworks and stuff but this is putting we may not we may only support pytorch and then also we were playing a little bit with this idea of active learning providing an api to to actually label interactively and stuff this was left a little bit paused but it may come back and this but the design idea was let's find a way to give an easy path for users to get the extra mile of quality in with your models okay okay understood so uh, yeah another important uh, component which i observed is the docker array. so uh, what are the challenges what are the challenges in productionizing this docker array? because i could see like it can handle all types of all types of data which is really amazing yeah so the story of docker array is quite fun actually it's one of the it, it dates from the beginning of gina so docker array was something that was in the core of the Gina the Gina main project. It was our language. It was our communication language. Every microservices was speaking this language. It was proto proto web based and stuff. But at the in with the time, we started to build some layers above these proto web objects, and we started to think to feel that the community liked that a lot. That it was an abstraction that people liked. So the then we extracted it from the main repo and we made it its own repo. And then it, when it blew in terms of, okay, now we have team that without all the noise of all the other repo, this repo can give you the, the power to the user that doesn't yet need to do microservices or communication. It, they just want to play around with the data and investigate and find some clusters and find nearest neighbors in some subset. Well, then we are going much further integrating with third party vector databases and so on. But I think that the main challenge was to explain the user why did we move it outside Gina and what is the point right now of having it alone. So as in many open source projects, I would say one of the challenges is to explain your ideas to the community and have them synced with the way you think okay that's, that's pretty cool and uh, so uh, yeah like could you talk a bit about your Gina team and the work culture and your background so the Gina team is a very diverse team we are we were born in the pandemic so we were we have born in an async way and very distributed we have people all around the globe especially in Europe and Asia so we have 
big team in Europe, India, and China. And the, the work culture is very open and very direct. We are grouped in different domains, and we have mainly the background is software engineers, cloud engineers, and machine learning passionate engineers and researchers. And it's a really cool. And if people want to check for our job openings, we would be very happy to, to listen to them. Great. So uh, what are the industrial collaborations in which the Gina team has been involved so far? So I, I don't know if I, we can name them industrial, but for instance, one one thing that we have been collaborating with is with Quadrant and Weaviate and some other vector databases outside that we have uh, integrated them with our Docker package so that people can enjoy the interfaces and the ease of use of a Docker array with the power of some vector databases that can hold um, millions of millions of data, for instance. Okay, okay, okay. So what is the main USP of uh, GNI AI solution? So the main selling point of GNI AI is that since we are not tackling a single problem of the neural search stack, and we are tackling the end to end, we have a lot of touch points with the users. We can, we are, we are helping the user that is just doesn't need too much infrastructure. So the only thing that it needs is to play around with data, find nearest neighbors, embed data locally or whatever. That these data scientists, this user, we can, we have a touch point with them. Then we also have a touch point with a software engineer that builds solutions on top of these ideas, with a with a cloud expert that needs to deploy them. So I think I would say that the selling point is this extensibility of the solution. Okay, okay. So uh, my last question for today. Uh, so what is the future of uh, neural search? So the future of neural search depends and it's very linked to the advances of research. So if research comes with a, the better research understands data and structured data, the better search. Actually, searching for someone, for, for a human being to search for something, they need to understand it, right, you know? And AI is actually understanding unstructured data better and better with time. So I would say that neural search should improve in the, at the same speed as AI in general. Um, grows. So I think it's a bright future for neural search and gene especially. So we are trying to improve in with the neural search, doing improving the fine tuner and so on, and also going into a more cloud native um, uh, ecosystem. Okay, okay, got it, got it. Okay. So that that covers all my questions for today, uh, Joanne. So thanks a lot for being here with me Thank and uh, answering all my queries actually so yep thank you thank you so much thank you very much i enjoyed it a lot and i hope the, the listeners also